To summon another witch. Ingredients. One bewitched animal. Yarn spun by a girl not yet seven. Egg of a black hen. Preparation. Take an earthen pot, not glazed. Place the water of the bewitched animal into the pot. Wind the yarn three times around the egg while calling out the three devil's names. Place this egg into the water in the pot. Place the cover upside down upon the pot, sealing the lid tightly so that no fumes can ooze out. Set the pot on the fire and say, Lucifer, devil, summon the sorcerer or witch before me in the three devil's name. Old Sal's Curse Old Sal's ghost lies in the graveyard, buried in a bottle. Dunstable people tell you with a nod toward the priory grounds. Old Sal had been known as a witch in this ancient English town. She had lived alone in a cottage with her big black cat, a creature bursting with devils. She had galloped through the sky on a stick for a nag, she had mumbled magic words and cast magic spells. One Sal had been a harmless fortune teller, but the older she grew, the more often she put the evil eye on those she disliked. Whenever she passed, strange things happened. Oh, Sal's a bad one, her neighbors whispered behind her back. She has dealings with the devil, that's perfectly plain. Gossips wagged malicious tongues. If a horse went lame or a cow stopped her milk, everyone was sure it was old Sal's doing. We should drive her out of town, muttered some. People gathered at corners to watch the old woman shuffle by. Her jumbled words and furtive glances terrorized them until they sought out the prior and asked what to do. The prior, who was a humbug, didn't like to admit he had no answer. I'll say some prayers for you, he told his parishioners. Only they can protect you against Sal's evil eye. But since dishonest prayers never do any good, the corn still withered in Farmer Piggott's field, little Barbie Perkins still had a wart on her nose, when Mistress Meg fell downstairs and broke her hip and John Puddlestone's hatchet lopped off his thumb, all Dunstable rose in anger against Sal. This was too much to bear. Sal's a witch. She must die, the town folk declared. So they tried her for witchcraft and dragged her to the stake in the market square. We'll send you to the place where all witches go. They shouted, heaping the wood high about Sal's feet. They lighted the pile. They taunted and jeered at the old woman. Then all at once the crowd's yell turned to cries of fear. With a sputter and a sizzle and a wild burst of flame, they watched old Sal's spirit rise up and up. From the red haze about it, they heard her screech. Holy water, book and bell, the black powers of blackest hell shall not destroy me. I'll come back to haunt you all until you give me Christian burial. The town folk sank to their knees in terror. The prior blanched like an almond. He tried to pray, but the words stuck in his throat. His knees quaked when he saw old Sal's face peering at him from the clouds overhead. I'll p -p -p pray for your soul, he stammered, though he now was sure that old Sal was a witch. Only leave us in p -p -p peace. I'll, I'll, I'll lay your ghost in ho -ho -ho holy ground. The prior said this to get rid of the spirit. He had scarcely finished when it disappeared with a cackle that sounded like the old woman's laugh. <laughs> that very night the prior stood at the altar and mumbled prayers for the witch's soul. The monks chanted lustily. The candles on the altar burned with clear, steady light. 
The prior was frightened, though he tried not to show it. The prayer books trembled in the worshipper's hands. Evil spirit, I banish you forever and ever, began the prior in a loud voice. This was not at all what he had promised poor Sal's departing spirit. Forever and ever, quavered his flock following the prior's example. In the name of, the prior continued, but before he could utter another word, old Sal's ghost suddenly appeared. It slid through the closed door. It glided up the aisle. Then the apparition stopped near the altar. The red haze that trailed after the spirit swirled through the church. Widow Parsons screamed when her bonnet strings singed on the end. The sexton winced at the hot breath on his neck. You've broken your word, whispered the spirit so softly only the prior could hear. I'll not be banished. I am not evil. But until you grant the burial you promised, I shall be. I'll have revenge on you. The prior paid no heed to the ghost, now close to his elbow. Instead, he started to chant again. In the name of the... But he got no farther. Before he could finish, the ghost struck his jaw. The prior reeled, then sprawled in a heap on the stone floor. The monks rushed forward to seize the wraith. It cuffed them until they roared with pain. Curses on you, wicked witch, screamed the prior, forgetting where he was. He struggled to his feet. He shook his fist in fury. The ghost slid off, chuckling, then vanished in smoke. The return of Sal's spirit set the town in a commotion. Women bolted their doors. They refused to venture out, even to the market. Children screamed in terror when mice squeaked in the walls or magpies pecked at the thatch. Sal's a worse nuisance dead than alive, complained the men over their mugs of ale. In spite of anything people could do, the ghost visited the priory night after night. The specter terrorized the prior more than anyone else. It tweaked his cassock. It screeched in his ear. One night the wraith even laid a finger cold as a tombstone on his shaven head. I'll not leave you in peace, hissed the ghost. Never until you bury me in holy ground. Not in a thousand years, stormed the prior, too angry now to keep his promise. I'll not have such a wicked creature in priory earth. He shot out a hand to clutch the spirit, but it swooshed from his grasp in a scream of scorn. The prior shivered until he almost dropped the good book. The next night and the next and the one after that, Sal's wraith whispered to the prior, when I was alive, I wasn't really a witch. I don't want to be one when dead. Let my soul rest in peace. Then I won't trouble anyone, so long as no one troubles me. But when I'm buried, I'll haunt anyone who disturbs my grave. A few nights later, a palmer a monk who had been to Jerusalem and brought back his blessed palm returned to Dunstable. I know how to lay this troublesome ghost, he told the prior. Just leave everything to me. The next day the palmer entered the priory all alone. He lighted the candles one by one. He opened the book and then sat down to wait. Before long the ghost glided up. It uttered a horrid shriek. The palmer wasn't frightened. From inside his robe he drew out a bottle with a long slender neck and a fat round belly. He held the flask up for the ghost to inspect. You're a clever ghost, the palmer said. You bully and badger. You make hideous sounds. You slide through keyholes. You dissolve into smoke. You whiff through bolted doors as if they weren't there. Yet one thing you can't do, of this I am certain. You can't swish into this bottle, turn around three times, and then swish out again. <laughs> as I'm a palmer, you can't do this. I 
can go anywhere. Old Sal Spirit sniffed in scorn. Then prove it if you dare, cried the palmer, holding out the bottle. He turned it around slowly until it gleamed like a jewel in the candlelight. With a noisy hiss, the ghost stretched out like a string. As though grease, the wraith slithered through the slender neck of the bottle. Once inside, the spirit twisted and squirmed. It turned around once and twice. But before it could revolve a third time and then slither out, the palmer clapped his hand over the open end. He sealed it tightly with some candle wax, then intoned a few holy words. With old Sal's ghost imprisoned, the palmer summoned the prior, who consented to bury the bottle in priory earth. He even said prayers for Sal's everlasting peace. From that day to this, no one has ever dared disturb old Sal's grave. Indeed, no one now living knows where it is. But just to make sure he won't rouse the sleeping spirit, the sexton never cuts the grass in the priory grounds. To make a witch pockmarked. Ingredients. Butter. Ivy or wintergreen. Three coffin nails. Preparation. Take the butter and broil it in an iron pan, frying the ivy or wintergreen. Stick the three nails in the sauce while saying the name of the appropriate witch. Now carry the sauce and nails into a place where neither sun nor moon shines through. The witch will now be sick for half a year with pockmarks over her entire body. Baba Yaga. Far, far away in Russia, very long ago, there lived a couple who had one daughter. They lived in a log hut on the edge of a huge forest. She was a beauty, that girl. Marusha the Fair, they called her. Her skin was as white as milk, her lips as red as blood, and the hair on her head black and glossy as a crow's wing. And what's more, Marusha was as kind and good-natured as she was pretty. After a while, her mother died. Then what did Marusha's father do but marry again? A bad woman she was, the one that he married, and she soon grew to hate Marusha. One day, while the man was out working, the stepmother said to Marusha, I want to make a new spring dress for you, my dear, so you must go and borrow needles and thread from my sister, who lives in the forest. Well, the girl was willing, but she had to ask her stepmother which paths she should take. As soon as her stepmother had begun to tell her, poor Marusha grew pale, for what her stepmother was telling her sounded just like the way to Baba Yaga's hut. Now, as Marusha knew well, this Baba Yaga was the worst witch in all Russia. She had iron teeth, her legs were nothing but bare bones, and she rode through the air in a mortar which she drove along with the pestle. She lived in a very queer kind of hut, too, for it stood on chicken's legs, and whichever way you tried to come up to it, the hut would turn around and stare at you with its windows. What was poor Marusha to do? Her father was working far away, and she did not dare to disobey her stepmother. So she tried to be brave. After all, there might be a real aunt who lived in the forest, and if so, she would have been frightened about nothing. So, thinking she might have a long walk, Marusha packed up some food in a red handkerchief and set off. She walked and she walked through the thick, dark, beautiful forest, and then, much sooner than she had expected, she came to a clearing, and there she saw a hut. But what sort of a hut? <laughs> you may well ask. The hut stood on chicken's legs, just as she had feared, and it seemed to Marusha that as she came toward it, it turned round to stare at her with its windows. Poor Marusha! However, it did no good to feel frightened, for she was quite sure that the hut had seen her. So she tried to open the rickety gate in the fence. Oh! Oog! 
squeaked the gate. It sounded just as if opening hurt its hinges. Without thinking what she was doing, Marusha felt in her pocket, and there at the very bottom was a little bottle of oil. She poured some oil into each hinge and went through the gate. As soon as she got into the yard, she saw that a girl was standing there. She didn't look much older than Marusha. She was crying bitterly, and when Marusha asked her who she was, she said that she was Baba Yaga's servant, and that the old witch had just pinched her black and blue in one of her wicked tempers. As she was crying and telling Marusha all this, she was all the time trying to push the loose hair out of her eyes. Without thinking what she was doing, Marusha untied her little bundle, put what was left of the food she had brought into her apron pocket, and gave the nice red handkerchief to the poor little servant girl to tie around her head to keep the hair out of her eyes. The poor girl was so surprised at getting a present and kind words that she couldn't say thank you, but only made a little bob curtsy and smiled. On went Marusha, and just as she got to the door of the hut, a miserable thin dog bounced out at her from a kennel and began to bark his head off. Without thinking what she was doing, Marusha fished in her pocket and pulled out a piece of bread. She gave it to the dog, who ate it as if he hadn't had anything to eat for days. And now, at last, Marusha had to knock at the door of the hut. Come in, answered a grating voice. Marusha opened the door, and there, sure enough, she saw old Baba Yaga herself, iron teeth, bone legs, and all. She was sitting at a loom, weaving. As she wove, the loom made a noise. To clack, to clack, to clack. Good morning, Auntie, said Marusha in her sweet voice. Good morning, my dear, says horrid old bony legs. Stepmother has sent me to ask you for the loan of needles and thread to sew me a dress. I'll see what I can find, says the witch with a grin. Sit down at the loom and weave a little while I go and look. So the witch stood up and Marusha sat down. She began to work the loom, ter clack, ter clack, and then Baba Yaga hobbled outside on her bony legs. Baba Yaga wasn't thinking about needles and threads, oh no. <laughs> Marusha soon knew that when she heard what she said to the servant girl. Go and get sticks, light a fire, and heat the bath. Draw plenty of water and scrub my niece. Scrub her nice and clean. I'm going to eat her. But the servant girl didn't want to eat the bath, and she didn't want Marusha to be eaten, for Marusha had spoken kindly to her and given her a red handkerchief. Though she was afraid of the witch, she walked slowly, and as for getting on with making a good fire, she fetched only one stick at a time, and as for the bath water, well, she fetched that in a sieve. But Baba Yaga didn't notice this. She had begun to walk around the hut so as to listen and make sure that Marusha hadn't run away. Are you weaving, little niece? she called out. Yes, Auntie, I'm weaving. And weave she did, so that the loom went ter clack, ter clack. Presently, Marusha looked up from her work and saw that a, a thin cat was sitting in the corner of the hut. Without thinking what she was doing, Marusha put one hand into her pocket and picked out a little bit of bacon. She threw it over to the thin cat, which ate it up in a twinkling. Then the cat stretched her paws and began to lick herself, saying to Marusha, Little girl, if you take my advice, you'll try to get out of here. Just then Baba Yaga passed by the window. Are you weaving, little niece? Yes, Auntie, I'm weaving, answered Marusha again, and to clack, to clack went the loom. They listened for a moment till Baba Yaga's footsteps had gone on. Here's a comb for you and a towel, went on the cat softly. They aren't what you think. Try to get away, and if Baba Yaga chases you, throw the towel behind you. If she chases you again, throw down the comb. 
thank you, cat, said Marusha. But how can I get out of here? If I stop weaving, she'll soon miss the tick-clack, tick-clack. She'll know that the loom has stopped. I'll see to that, answered the cat. Let me come where you are. So Marusha stood up, and the cat sat down. Tick-clack, 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 went the loom. If that thin cat wasn't much good at weaving, she was a grand one for muddling everything about. You can hardly imagine the mess she made with Baba Yaga's threads. Warp and woof, woof and warp, all tangled and crossed up. The worse the muddle got, the more the cat smiled. As for Marusha, she slipped quietly out through a door at the other side of the hut and went through the gate. Baba Yaga came back, and again she listened below the window. Are you weaving, little niece? Yes, Auntie, I'm weaving, answered the thin cat in a squeaky voice, trying to mimic Marusha. As it spoke, its claws were tangling every thread on the loom worse than ever. Soon old Baba Yaga came back into the hut. What was her fury when she saw that there was no Marusha weaving at the loom, only the thin cat making a dreadful mess? How dare you play me such a trick, shouted Baba Yaga to the cat in a rage. Long as I've served you, hissed the cat, you have never given me so much as a bone. But Marusha gave me bacon. Baba Yaga rushed out of the hut. There was the thin dog. Dog, why did you let her escape, shouted the witch. You should have barked and flown at her throat. Long as I've served you, growled the dog. You've never given me anything better than burnt black crust. But Marusha gave me a slice of white bread the very first time she saw me. Baba Yaga rushed on. And first she shouted at the servant girl, and then at the squeaky hinges. But the servant girl said to her, Long as I've served you, you've never given me so much as a rag. But Marusha gave me a red handkerchief the first time she ever saw me. When she got such answers, Baba Yaga flew into a worse rage than ever. She gnashed her iron teeth, jumped into her mortar, and gave a terrific push with the pestle. Away she went, flying along in pursuit of Marusha. Nash, gnash went her iron teeth. Clatter, clatter went her pestle. But Marusha had been running as fast as she could, and by this time she had got quite a long way down the path which led through the forest. All the time as she went, she listened. Yes, something was coming, she could hear. Nash, gnash, clatter, clatter. That must be Baba Yaga, thought Marusha to herself. I'd better do as the thin cat told me. So she threw down the towel. Almost before it touched the ground, the towel had become a wide river, a wide, brimming river, and Marusha was on one side and Baba Yaga was on the other. The magic river was so wide that the old witch couldn't possibly cross it with one push of her pestle, so she had to come down to earth. Oh, how she gnashed her iron teeth with spite. However, Baba Yaga wasn't going to be beaten by a thin cat and a little girl. <laughs> she had a big barn full of oxen. She went quickly to it and drove all those oxen down to the river. They were so thirsty that as soon as they got there, they drank up every drop of water. Then Baba Yaga was able to make one hop of it, and like that, she and her mortar crossed over. All this time, Marusha had gone on running and was a lot farther away, but she wasn't far enough. Baba Yaga was soon able to catch her up. So fast did she travel in her mortar. When she saw how close the witch was, Marusha remembered the thin cat again and threw down the comb. Almost before it touched the ground, a huge new forest sprang up. The trees were much taller than the trees of the real forest, so tall and so close together that there was no way of getting through them or over them. 
But Baba Yaga set to work with her iron teeth and began to gnaw at the huge trees, but it was all in vain. However hard she worked, for one tree that she gnawed down, the magic forest grew two more. When she saw that, Baba Yaga knew that she was beaten at last and went back in disgust. Meanwhile, Marusha's father had come home to that. Where's Marusha? he asked the stepmother. Oh, I've just sent the child to her aunt's to borrow needles and thread. Just as she spoke, in rushed Marusha, quite out of breath, with her hair flying and her clothes all torn. When she saw her father, she threw herself sobbing into his arms. What's the matter with you? asked her father. Oh, father, father, sobbed Marusha. Stepmother sent me to auntie's to ask for needles and thread, but it was no auntie of mine. It was Baba Yaga. She meant to eat me. How's this? How's this? said the father, looking sternly over the girl's shoulder at the stepmother. With that, Marusha told her father the whole story about the hinges, the servant girl, the dog, and the thin cat. As she told the tale, the stepmother soon began to see that it was all up, and before Marusha had finished, she had slipped off and away into the forest. Whether she ever got to Baba Yaga's hut, or whether she was eaten by a bear, doesn't matter either to you or to me. What is certain is that not long afterwards, the little servant girl, followed by the thin dog and the thin cat, came running down the forest path to Marusha's hut. Marusha and her father welcomed them, and neither they nor Marusha nor her father ever saw that bad stepmother or Baba Yaga again. To cause a witch to die. Ingredients. One heart of a cow. Butter. Three nails from a coffin of a corpse. Preparation. Take a little butter and fry the cow's heart. Then take the three nails and pierce the heart through and through while saying the name of the appropriate witch. Works best if you can get the heart of a cow killed by that witch. She will die as soon as the heart is pierced by the third nail. Fully approved. The Bewitched Court In East Wales... There's a mysterious pool that everyone knows is bewitched. Linkleys, which means in Welsh, the swallowed court, is the name of this pool. Long ago, its dark waters swallowed a palace, a king, and a court. Today, all lie buried in the mud of the mere where the yellow flag weeds and green rushes grow. The curse of a witch betrayed brought this grievous thing to pass, people say. Then they tell the story of Evan, the king, who once lived in the palace on the site of the pool. The palace, they say, was of dazzling beauty. It had steps of white marble and gold weathercocks. The windows gleamed and sparkled like a hundred thousand gems. Nightingales sang in the pear trees at dusk. All day blue peacocks strutted in the garden where jasmine scented the air. In this palace King Evan held his court, and his reign was just and good. At his side sat Queen Mary, whose face was the fairest in Wales. Her long hair shimmered like threads of spun gold. Her lips were like a red cherry, her eyes like violets in May. The king loved Mari madly. He showered her with rubies and diamonds and pearls, yet all the jewels in the world could add nothing to the beauty of the queen's shining face. One might suppose the king the happiest of men, but he was not, for secretly he was sorely troubled by a mystery that surrounded his beloved wife. One night out of every seven, she vanished from the palace. Where did she go? What did she do? Why did she never tell her husband, the king? Such were the questions that weighed upon Evan's mind. Nine years came and went. With each passing year, Mary grew more lovely. But the king watched his wife with fear, clutching at his heart. 
At night he tossed and turned in his golden bed. He brooded alone when the queen left his side. Yet she only smiled when she went away. Heaven dared not ask whither she went. The day came at last when the king could no longer endure his fears alone. In secret he went to Willen the wizard, his chief adviser at court. Willen was a man of learning and cunning. He could read the signs in the stars. He could recite magic spells. Surely the wizard would have power to help him, thought the king. Willen, he said, as the wizard bowed before him, after nine years of silence, I must reveal a secret, else I shall die of the pain that gives me no peace. But should you violate my confidence, I shall slay you with my own hand. The old man bowed until his white beard swept the floor. Have no fear, sire, he said. Long before you were born, I served your father. With him I shared dark secrets of state. I never failed him. I shall not fail his son. Let me help you at least advise on the matter that breaks your heart. It is the queen, said the monarch. He dropped his voice to a whisper. Mari is a fairy. She belongs not to this world, but to the kingdom of spirits who live inside the earth. This I knew when I wooed her, but I loved her, so nothing mattered but to make her my wife. The king sighed deeply, then fell silent. And now, sire, are you sorry? Willen prompted. No, cried the king fiercely, no. I love Mari as never before. I, I would wed her a thousand times over, even on her own terrible terms. Again Willen waited for the king to continue, but the monarch sat on his throne, his face buried in his hands. Her own terrible turns, the wizard repeated softly. Tell me, what do you mean? Where did you meet Mari? How do you know she's a fairy? It may be, sire, you are wrong. No, not wrong, the king spoke as if to himself. It was when I was hunting nine years ago out on the heath. I galloped past her. She was dabbling her toes in the stream that flowed close to a cave in the rocks. Her hair was a golden mist in the sun. She smiled into my eyes as I dashed after the fox. It took refuge in the cave. I, I didn't pursue him. Instead, I wheeled my horse around. I returned to the girl. The king wiped his brow. Then he continued, We sat beside the stream until sundown. I told Mari I loved her. I held her tiny hands in mine. I begged her to be my queen. I could see that the girl loved me, but for some reason she hesitated. After a long time, I learned why. If I marry you, she said, it must be on one condition, that I leave you one night in seven. You must promise never to ask where I go. If you do, if you follow me, or reveal my secret to anyone, ruin will come to us both. But why? Tell me why, I pleaded. Because I'm a fairy, Vari said softly, searching my face with those deep violet eyes. In the end, I wed her without further question, and now, nine years later, I have betrayed her because I have no peace, cried the king in anguish. You, Willen, are the only one who can help me. You must devise a charm to break the spell that takes Mari from me. An expression of cunning flitted across the wizard's sharp features as he studied the king's bowed head. Come, come, coaxed the old man soothingly. You must not despair. Set your heart at ease, my king. I, Willen, am here to serve you, though it cost my own life. Tell me what to do. Follow the queen tonight, commanded the king, too desperate to note the greed in the wizard's face. Follow her when she leaves the palace gates at midnight. Take heed she doesn't suspect you, or all will be lost. See where Mari goes, observe what she does. Then work some magic to keep my fairy wife from leaving me again. What you ask is dangerous, declared Willen after a pause. If I should fail, but I won't even consider that. 
My life is at stake. Sire, <laughs> but I shall find a way. Worry no more about your queen. Leave everything to me. Please start at once, cried the king impatiently when the wizard made no move to leave the chamber. A man of learning must live, Willem said, clearing his throat. The risk, as I have said, is great. Name your price, then, and get on with your work, shouted the king. You have much to do before midnight. Should not the price equal the risk of the mission, asked the old man, eyes glinting with avarice. To accomplish this perilous task, I shall require one thousand one hundred and seven pieces of gold, and one out of every ten cows born with black spots. So be it, cried the king in disgust. Do not haggle with me when the matter at hand is so important. He waved his hand in dismissal, then fell back, brooding on his throne. That night, Willen hid behind a tree until Mari left the palace and slipped through the great golden gates. He followed quickly as she sped across the heath. Heading toward the hill, she glided faster and faster, the wizard knotted his long robe about his waist, then followed the queen at a distance. He sprang over rocks. He leapt across gullies. The slim figure in white moved swiftly until it came to a stream. Mari skirted the water. When she reached a cave in the rocks nearby, she hesitated. Then she disappeared. Aha, panted Willen, not far behind. That's where she goes. She enters the cave to the underworld where the evil fairies live. The wizard sat down on a rock near the cave. To entice Mari out with a spell will be easy, he thought. Then I must bewitch her so she can never return to the spirit world. That will take more skill, but I can do it. After tonight I shall be a rich man, rich. And now with the king in my power, he'll not dare order me about. So the wizard gloated over his good fortune, too sure of his own cunning to dream he could fail in his task. He stretched his tired limbs, he rested his old bones. Then he turned toward the cave and started a chant. Come forth, lovely queen, come out of your cavern. Let me gaze on the face that enchants all men and enslaves them forever to the fairest. On earth. Willen had barely finished the magic words when a horrible witch whistled out from the mouth of the cavern. With a hiss, she snatched the sorcerer from the rock. She wound her long fingers about his throat. So it's Willen the wizard, she shrilled, squeezing his neck until his tongue lolled out and his eyes popped from his head. You followed me here tonight. Look at me, she continued, flinging the wizard from her so violently he fell to his knees. Look at me. I am Mari, the fairest on earth. The king has betrayed me, and you, old man, you have discovered my secret. You. Mari, Willen gasped, recoiling in horror, gazing at the hideous toothless hag, the wizard could feel his magic powers ebb away. Yes, Mari, mocked the witch with a dreadful laugh. For six days out of seven, the loveliest woman in Wales. But on the seventh night, I must return to the underworld when I am transformed into the revolting creature you see before you. Now that my own husband has betrayed me, I can never again assume human form. In punishment for his crime, I shall drown him together with all his court. As for you, skulking creature of the night, cried the witch, turning on Willen with fury. Death is too good for you. Your punishment is to be chained to my side forever. Speaking thus, the witch seized the wizard's long beard. She dragged him, screaming and struggling, into the cave. She pulled him behind her down, down to the underworld where only the wickedest fairies dwell. Of the king 
his fate, you already know. He in his court in his beautiful palace, with the white marble steps and the gold weathercocks, all sank to the bottom of Linkly Pool. Today dark waters flow over Evan's proud head. Such is the curse of the fairy wife his uneasy love betrayed. The Stone King. In England's Cotswold Hills, a huge upright stone stands alone near the ridge of a green slope. Crimson poppies grow in the grass around this stone, and when cold winds blow over the hillside, their petals fall like drops of blood. Then the elder tree nearby, laden with its black and bitter fruit, seems to mutter. And in the valley below, where lies Long Compton village, the swallows circle the tower of the parish church. They whirl and spin like dancing dervishes, and scream out shrilly the tale of the hill and the stones that lie there. The village people listen and nod, and gladly repeat the story to curious strangers. The stone up there is a king, say the old folk, and the elder tree is a witch. And there, they point across the road to stones in a circle, so many you can hardly count them. That's the king's army. And over there are the five whispering knights. The witch of the hill turned them all to stone. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the stones have lain on the hillside. How they got there, no one knows, really. Some say the Druids, early Britain's pagan priests, carried them there for a temple. Others claim they were tombs of the shepherds who once lived on the slope. But most of the folk of Long Compton believe the hill is bewitched. Only when the witch loses her power will the stones turn back into men. These facts are plain as can be, for strange things still happen on the hill, especially at midnight on New Year's Eve. When the church bells in the valley chime twelve, the stones hear the sound. They turn and march down the hill in silence. From the spring at the bottom they drink a toast. Then back to their places they march again. This wonder and others folk claim to have seen. But the story of how all this came to pass began long, long ago when a foreign king invaded England. No one remembers his name, but people say that he sailed from Denmark he landed on the eastern coast, then marched to the west with his army and his knights. He scattered the Saxon foe before him like chaff and advanced a conquering hero intent upon ruling England as king. Soon this island will be mine, mine, he declared to the five knights at his side. White hawthorn circled the pastures like a bride's wreath. The king sniffed the sweet air of spring. He listened to the lark. All this shall belong to me, he told his companions. Seven nights ago, as I slept in my tent, the wise woman promised this in a dream. When long Compton thou shalt see, England's king thou shalt be. We'll soon reach the spot, the king continued, pointing to a distant hill. We must cross these downs, then march to the ridge over there. Long Compton lies in the valley below. I'll ride ahead, my friends, while you bring up the army. Meet me at the foot of the slope. The king spurred his black horse, then galloped away, far ahead of the knights and his troops. When he came to the knoll, he dismounted. He studied the place, then led his horse to a spring. We'll rest here, my beauty, and await the army said the king, patting the animal's shining flanks. With bright, eager eyes, he studied the hill. When I am king of England, said the Dane, fingering the jeweled hilt of his sword, I'll build my castle on that summit. Then I can look down on Long Compton each morning when I wake. 
The invader laughed softly, recalling the wise woman's prediction of glory and power. Dreams of easy victory filled his mind. He paid scant heed to the army as it advanced over the downs. He did not notice that the five knights no longer led the troops. Huddled behind the soldiers, the horsemen seemed to argue among themselves. Already the king of the Danes imagines himself king of the Saxons, sneered the first knight. Yes, and claims that the wise woman foretold his success in a dream, said the second. But most likely he's planning how to rid himself of us. Our king will never share victory with his knights. Then we must stop him before he wins, shouted the third knight fiercely. He waved his mailed fist toward the hilltop. Keep your voice down, ordered the fourth knight. Do you want the common soldiers to hear us? He came closer. Tell me, what dark deed ferments in that evil mind of yours? He rasped in the third knight's ear. To stab the king from behind, muttered the third, grasping his dagger. No, no, gasped the fifth knight. He drew back in horror. Of murder I will have no part. That you will, fool, cried the third knight scornfully. Why not kill the Dane? Once he has conquered England, he will have no need of us. He'll send us home or exile us to distant castles. He might even slay us to keep power in his own hands. But he was ever just, objected the fifth knight. So far, yes, admitted the third. But remember, he has never had such a prize in his grasp. I tell you, friends, to kill the king is the only way to be sure we share the sweet fruits of conquest. Let him stain his hands with the royal blood, muttered the first knight in his beard. <laughs> then I'll take over the army. I'll proclaim myself king. As for that knave, I'll hang him for treason. Thus the five plotted to kill their leader before he could reach the hilltop. But when they joined him at the spring, the knights smiled at the king. They saluted, then proposed a toast to his victory. To England's future king, they shouted. I shall lead the advance on foot, said the Dane, impatient to start. You trusted friends will follow me. The army will march in the rear. Keep a sharp watch on every side. The enemy may lurk in ambush. Remember, he concluded, the eyes glittering with ambition. Once I gain the summit and see the village in the valley, I shall rule this land. And we, whispered the knights, be your vassals unless we prevent it. Sword in hand, the king strode ahead. He did not glance back. At first the traitors followed closely, but when the king, eager to attain his goal, forgot them, they drew aside. When shall we do it? the first knight asked. Not until he is almost there, hissed the third. He concealed his dagger in his mailed bosom. That's a risk, objected the others. No, the third knight said with an evil smile. He would suspect us if we gathered around before then. As the knight schemed and plotted against his life, the king leapt forward. It will be easy to gain the top, he thought, growing more confident with every step. There was no sign of the enemy. Ahead the hill jutted boldly against the azure sky. I am almost there, cried the king. He cast wary glances to right and left. Seven long strides, and I'll see Long Compton in the valley. Then I shall be the conqueror of England. He had already spoken when the hill began to shake. A black cloud appeared. It wrapped itself about the invader until he could see nothing. Then out of the blackness stepped a horrible witch. Her eyes burned like coals in her ashen face. Her body was twisted and gnarled as an ancient tree. In one hand she clutched an ash stick. The witch stretched out her arms to block the king's advance. He glared at her with anger and fear. Stop, shrieked the witch. You shall go no farther. 
king lunged at the creature with his sword. Stop, foolish king! This hill belongs to me, screamed the witch, who grew taller and blacker before the king's very eyes. Then in a shrill voice she chanted words that made the Dane tremble. Never shall thou take those seven long strides to the top. Never shalt thou long come to see, never king of England be. Out of my way, old hag, shouted the king in a rage. Stand aside before I cut you in two. I shall be king of England, so the wise woman promised me. He slashed at the witch, but again darkness enfolded him. When it lifted, she still stood there. She waved her stick three times over the hill, three times over the head of the king. Then she pronounced her spell. Rise up, earth, stand fastic. King of England, thou shalt never be. For threatening death, for defying me, Thou and thy men shall whorestones be, and I, witch of the hill, an eldern tree, to stand forever and keep watch on thee. As the witch waved her stick, the king saw the earth heave into a mound on the crest of the hill. He struggled to take the last seven strides, but he could not move his limbs. The blood turned cold in his body. He tried to summon his knights. He strove to call his troops. The words froze on his lips. He could utter no sound. The last thing the Danish king heard were the words, Thou and thy men shall whore stones be. The last thing he saw were the witch's burning eyes glaring from her ashen face. The last thing he knew was that he was doomed never to be England's king. Today all is quiet on the lonely slope where the stone king stands apart from his men. People say the witch who dwells in the elder tree allows no one to touch the stones without suffering her wrath. In olden times some flouted her power with dire results. There was the baker who boasted he could count all the men in the king's army. He made a sack full of small round loaves of bread. The story goes that he carried them up the slope to the stone circle that measures almost a hundred feet across. The baker set one loaf on top of each stone. He counted as he passed from one to the next. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven until he reached seven times three. But before the foolish man could draw another loaf from his sack, he fell down dead. His death should have proved that the cunning of the witch was stronger than the cunning of men. But instead of taking to heart the baker's awful fate, the people of Long Compton decided to move the stone king. They would take him to the valley, they said. We'll set the king up in the marketplace, the village fathers agreed, a warning to all who would invade our land. It took eight chestnut horses and 18 strong men to carry the king down the hill. No sooner was he there than disaster came to Long Compton. People sickened and died. Crops failed. A strange disease afflicted the sheep. The stone king was to blame, everyone said. He must be returned to the hill. But this time, the eight chestnut horses and eighteen strong men failed to budge him an inch. The beasts tugged with all their might. They pulled and strained until the ropes broke. One horse fell to the ground and couldn't get up. The only one left that could haul a load was an old gray mare. But she is too feeble for such a weight, objected many. Only their dire need made the villagers consent in the end to hitch the gray with the chestnuts. No sooner had they done so than the horses dragged their burden with the greatest of ease. 
They took the stone king back up the slope, where he still stands. No one now doubts that the witch is in the elder tree, or that she'll remain there. As for the stone king and his men, they too will stay where they are until judgment day.